Hi, and welcome to Video Game Book Club, the show where we pick, we play, and we discuss a video game each and every month. I'm your host, JP Gomez, and with me, always, Ben Tizzle Toops. How you doing, Ben? What's up? I'm okay. How are you doing? I think is the better question. I am sick currently with some sort of viral thing. So if I sound kind of weird, uh. I'm so sorry. But uh, I'm trying to power through for our Harthian friends and for yes. all our listeners, you know, mom and my mom and your mom. So <laughs> you're God's strongest soldier right now. Yeah. That's what you are. Exactly. And you're powering through. <laughs> we're this this looks a little different. We're uh we're we're doing a little remote podcast now. Honestly, I thought it was gonna be harder to do it this way, but you know, it seems like you're right here with me. So all good. Bro, we're we're pros at this. We're just we're just two podcasters. That's it. <laughs> two podcasters. Who would have thought? Not me. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Before we dive in into the expanse of Outer Wilds, I have a question. A little bit of an icebreaker, if yeah. you will. I don't That's know good. about you, but if Outer Wilds taught me anything, whether that was quantum physics or whatever mm. else it tried to teach me, <laughs> one thing that I loved about the game was its music. I feel like I'm not the yeah. person who like will listen to OSTs from other games, but I genuinely felt that I could and I did listen to Outer Wilds music outside of playing the game. So I wanted to ask you if there are no, no. any games that you've played that made you feel the same way oh man i think the one that first and foremost comes to my mind is uh metal gear solid 5 mm -hmm. the phantom pain the soundtrack in that game is such a banger yeah it like the all of the songs are these like old school kind of you know, very 80s sounding. Like there's there's one track in particular that sticks in my mind mm -hmm. from the very beginning of the game. Um, that's definitely one for me. What about you? What what sticks in your mind? I think the first thing when I thought about this question was uh, Final Fantasy X. I just remember being a kid and listening to like two Xanarkand and all that. Uh, and all the boss music, it's just like really intense, like metal. <laughs> and I really enjoyed that. Yeah. Uh, but the other game was uh, Death Store, which I had uh, mentioned in a previous episode, um, a game that I really love. And it has kind of a similar serene kind of melancholic music like Outer Wilds. Yeah. Um, but, you know, growing up playing FIFA, dude, that's not original soundtrack, but like, <laughs> dude, the oh tracks from FIFA or Tony Hawk Pro Skater, bangers, all of them. Yeah, Tony Hawk Pro Skater, that's such a good one. Yeah, <laughs> the the track, I still like remember some of oh, those songs. I have so I have like a playlist like on Spotify that I listen to sometimes. Oh my God. <laughs> that's awesome. But I mean, you're right. So I feel like the music plays a huge part in this game mm -hmm. and I think you will, you know, we'll probably talk as we go about some ways in which that is, but, you know, talk, talking about the game. So obviously the game we're talking about this month is Outer Wilds and it's a game that's really hard to describe, but I'm going to ask you to describe it. So <laughs> give me, give me your best like summary, try to summarize the game for, for me and all the viewers. Okay. Wow. You turned it on me this time. Um, <laughs> Outer Wilds is a space adventure exploration game that tasks you to uncover a overarching story of how your universe works, which is a crazy right. kind of task that you have to do. But basically you are an explorer and you realize on your first expedition out to space that you are inside a time loop and that all of these, well, this race of beings from millions of years ago tried to do a certain task and you're trying to figure yeah. out what they wanted to do and maybe you'll achieve it at the end so that's kind of how the maybe game works. you will maybe you won't we'll, <laughs> we'll find out yeah no i mean that that's a really good summary i think this game you know like we both said is so expansive and so abstract in a way mm -hmm. that it is hard to describe yeah. but you know um, we're going to do our best. So I feel like, you know, a good place to start is with a spoiler warning, obviously, yeah. because if you, this game, and we're, we're going to talk about why I'm sure, but 
this game is a game that really um, functions based on your knowledge, like your personal knowledge that you have yes. in your brain, mm -hmm. right? So any information that you have going into the game is going to affect your gameplay experience in some way. Yeah. Um, and so like, you know, watching YouTube videos about this game, every game, every video starts with this crazy spoiler warning, right? Mm -hmm. Of like, do not watch this video <laughs> if you have not played this game. Yeah. Um, so, you know, obviously we've, we've given the spoiler warning. Now the viewers can decide for themselves. Um, even if you haven't played the game, I think this will still be an interesting discussion because it is so unique. Yeah. Um, but if you like these sorts of gameplay experiences, definitely come back to this podcast after you've played it for sure. Yeah. It's one of those things where like, not to make any comparisons, but let's say that we're trying to describe Interstellar uh, to someone yeah. who has never seen the movie. You probably won't get half of the things that we're saying, but then you wa you'll watch the movie and you'll experience it your own way and you'll like it. So, you know, either way, I think you can probably listen to this, but definitely once you've seen Interstellar once or you experience that once, like it's hard to experience it again in a different sense. So we're going to we're going to like direct you in our perception of the game. Uh, so yeah. that's, that's the warning too, but yeah, a hundred percent to start. So to start, mm -hmm. yes. To, I mean, just to kind of jump into the game. So the first thing, like you said, the start of this game is you, you don't really even know what you personally are to start the game. You just wake up yeah. on a camp, on a campfire. It's dark. You're in a little town and this is kind of where the tutorial of the game picks up, right? Mm -hmm. So what was what was your experience kind of with that tutorial area? Like, did you feel it did a good job setting things up, the gameplay mechanics, stuff like that? What do you think? I, I have two opinions on it. I think, I think if it was just a tutorial, uh, it would have been fine. Uh, there's a couple of things that you do that you have to do periodically in the game. So one is you fly this mock ship as soon as you wake up, mm -hmm. the Esker, no, not Esker, uh, the Slate, I think, the guy that uh, fixes your ship, tells you, hey, you got to go check out our our guy in the tower, Hem Hempfries. Yeah. I don't know his name. I think something with a name. Is in the tower. Yes. You go, and basically, there's like a series of tasks that you do, yeah, optional, that you do uh, when, right. to get to that guy. And one of them is to fly a mock ship. And I felt that flying that mock ship was harder than anything else I ever did in the game. Like flying that was so hard. And I was really wanting to land on the little pads the, uh, in front of you to practice. And I couldn't. I was so bad at it. Okay. So I have to say, I totally agree with that. And w my first like moment of flying the ship, flying the little toy ship, I was like, what am I getting myself into? <laughs> yeah, because same. the it was so hard to control and so what you played this game on pc i assume I did. steam deck or yes something? both okay yeah steam deck and pc so we were we were moving this past month and so up until like a week or two ago i didn't really have access to my pc um so i played this game on the switch mm. and i like this is a game that i feel like probably pushes the switch harder than i can see anything that. else yeah like the Switch was struggling with this yeah. game. Like the frame rate was not very good. There was like 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 a quarter second, half second input delay mm. on like every single one of my inputs. Like did you mm -hmm. you didn't I mean I assume you didn't have that. Nothing. Right? I had no issues playing the okay. game on Steam Deck or on so PC. The, it played beautifully on Steam Deck actually. Okay, well I'm happy for you <laughs> because my experience like I didn't know I it was so bad. Mm. The controls were so bad on the Switch. Like, the control scheme is fine, but just, like, inputting controls, especially with stuff as specific as flying around, controlling the switch, the ship, like, it was bad. Yeah. And it took me a long, long time to get used to. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that, you know, that first experience, controlling the little toy ship was a little bit of, like, a... a a pause moment for me like yeah. oh god this this might be bad <laughs> and then the, the second thing that it teaches you it's a lot better where you have to fix like a satellite or whatever in this anti-gravity yeah. or zero gravity cave that 
as soon as I jumped in and I was kind of thrusting with my suit, that's when I really understood the physics of the game. And actually, I thought that was a lot right. better than the actual flying the mock ship. Uh, now, yeah, totally, there's not a lot totally. of stuff that you do. Well, there's not a lot of stuff that you do in zero gravity. Like that was that intense, I felt as like fixing those satellites, but it kind of teaches you, okay, when your ship breaks, you have to fix certain things and you have to jump and get to them. But like, I never, I was never floating in space trying to fix it. I don't know if you had to do that, <laughs> but, uh, um, I think I only did it once, yeah. but yeah, it, the tutorial made it seem like that would be a bigger, I thought I was going to have to fix was, everything. For sure. I was like, Oh my God, nothing, yeah. break, nothing works. Like I, I had to do it. I had to do it on the ground all the exactly. time, just because I was like, you know, coming in for some hot landings. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, there, I think there was only once where I like, you know, repaired my ship mm -hmm. mid-flight or something. Uh, but, then, so aside from yeah. aside from like the the tutorial aspects, there is a little bit and like stuff you might not even realize of like lore setup at the start of the game, right? So as far as you know you're just this little alien pilot, right? And you're just well, tasked to... You're not an alien to, to yourself. You're in... Uh, yeah, <laughs> right. Fair, fair point. You're just a guy. You're just a guy. You're just a dude. Yeah. You're chilling. <laughs> you're just a, br a bro. You're just a bro. Um, right. But so you're just tasked, basically, all you know to do is go to the tower, get the launch codes, and get in your ship, mm -hmm. right? Like, that's that's really all the instructions you have, you know, it at the start of the game pretty much yeah so it, it was kind of interesting like you can you can go and do like so many things from that point yeah you, the game basically tells you at the beginning hey this is why your kind of race exists like the herthians are there to explore the universe and today is the first day that you're going to go out there and explore or your i guess your solar system for the first time you think it's your first time doing it and yeah that's that's the setup so you're like okay i'm a fresh astronaut let's get out there everyone in the village tells you about all the other astronauts that are already exploring and where they are and then you go and you find them or that's kind of like the task that you have and then you talk to hornsfeld he tells you here are your launch codes go ahead and explore what are you going to do first and you have like five answers to give. I think I said something like, I'm going to try not to crash, basically. Yeah. <laughs> That's my answer. Yeah, fair. But the game tells you you can do anything you want. And then you walk out of the of the observatory and something kind of freaky happens. A statue yeah. turns to you slowly. Then its eyes glow purple. And then you relive what you just did at the beginning of the game. Yeah. Yeah. Which was basically and so that's like a very... That's like a super abstract moment, right? Like in that moment, you've you're you're probably fifteen minutes into starting this game. Fifteen, like, bro. It took me an hour to get there for sure. <laughs> okay, damn. Okay, yeah. No, that's probably with like the tutorial stuff. That's yeah, yeah. probably more accurate. But that's like kind of the first story beat. I feel mm -hmm. right where like it's like the first kind of story thing that happens, and you you have zero context for any of this, right? So at that moment, it's just like what just happened pretty much yeah. like what is what is going on here um but so yeah so you get you know a little bit of the setup about the nomai they're these kind of people that inhabited the universe or the solar system rather before uh before you did you don't really know how long ago that was mm -hmm. um but there's these like nomai relics you're introduced to the translator tool where you can mm -hmm. decipher the writing that they left behind, which turns out to be like a pretty huge portion of the game. Like all of it um, almost. Yeah, pretty much all of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and past that point, um, you can pretty much do whatever you want. So once you, you know, got to the observatory and looked around the museum and stuff like that, you get back to your ship. What is the first thing that you did? I got back to my ship and the first thing was, let me go to the moon, baby. I was like, let me yeah, go to the yeah. moon. My boy Esker is up there uh, and he's he's whistling. And that's yep. the first thing that I did. I went to the moon. I talked so, to him. So the whistling. Yeah. So one of the important like kind of gameplay mechanics, I guess, right, is this signal detector. It's yep. called the signal scope mm -hmm. in the game. 
and you can use it. You can point it around and like scan different frequencies and basically point it around and try to locate these signals. And so, you know, we talked about earlier how music is like a big part of this game. Well, it turns out that kind of the signal for all of the different uh, Hearthian explorers is their instrument, right? Yep. So they all have, you know, their own instrument. And Esker, like you said, has a little, um, what well, was he, uh, I forget, what was his signal? What did you say? Yeah, whistling. He was whistling. Whistling, yeah. right. So you point your signal scope at the moon and you hear this little whistle, right? Mm -hmm. This nice little, nice little melody. And yeah, so I think the moon is like so obviously it's just like right there. It's right start. there. So that's you're like, not good at flying yet. So it's like the easiest no. thing to get to is is the moon. Yeah. So that's that's the first thing that I did. I landed, I talked to Esker, uh, and he told me to go uh, you know, you can go to the poles of every planet. They there's always like something important. And so, well, a moon isn't a planet, but every celestial being in this solar system has something important in the poles. So immediately the yeah. game teaches you, hey, as soon as you land somewhere, try to go to the poles and you'll find something that will maybe give you a clue to this yeah. expansive world or galaxy, I guess. Solar system, I don't even know. Too many celestial words. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. You go up there and then you see Esker's notes that say that there's this Hearthian that has been missing for a long yep. time and he finally heard their harmonica playing mm -hmm. weirdly in timber hearth which is your planet and so yep. i was thinking okay that's where i want to go next i'm gonna follow that harmonica but i was tired and so i paused the game and i turned it off i didn't know how to save it i thought that whenever i booted the game again i'll be exactly where i was so I turned the game off and then when I booted it back up, I had to redo everything that I had just done. Oh my God. And it honestly, <laughs> it kind of broke me a little bit then. I'm not going to lie. I was kind of upset that. That is a disaster. <laughs> saved. I didn't finish the loop. The supernova never happened, which we're about to talk about. And yeah. Yeah, I had to redo and that and that broke me. I'm not going to lie. I, I took a break for like five days because I didn't want to replay an hour of my life. <laughs> that's um, so funny. Yeah. But that's fair, right? Because it's like there's no there's no like, you know, little tip that tells you how progress is saved. Right. Yeah. Like it's something you have to figure out on your own pretty mm -hmm. much like I mean, like everything else in this game. So I feel like that's kind of fair that you you wouldn't have known that yeah. like there's no other way to know unless you experience it. And I feel like there's probably like the devs might've expected you to just like die somehow yeah. in those first like hour or so, like, you know, you crash into the moon, you fly into the sun. Like they, they probably yeah. just expect like you, you forget to put your suit on and you like asphyxiate or something. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Which definitely. Oh, dude, all the, all the time. <laughs> yeah. I always forget. Um, but that was my feeling is that like the, you know, the controls for me, like I said, were not good, but it almost became oh, you didn't like more the of controls. like a gameplay. No, just because of like the input lag with the switch oh, okay, and stuff okay. like that. But the you controls don't were fine, okay, but yeah, just, yeah. just like it was so, and I feel like the, you know, the, the controls in general are a little like touchy and sensitive mm -hmm. as well. So I felt like, you know, in some ways, that was almost a gameplay mechanic where you're supposed to, like, die in all these goofy ways yeah. and, like, <laughs> crash into planets and get crushed by stuff to, like, reinforce that, that loop mechanic. Mm -hmm. But so we're, we're talking about the loop. So what was – how did you die the first time, basically, when you got back into it? So, what, yeah, once I got back into it, I did everything that I did, and I went to Timber Hearth, followed right. the harmonica sound, and I found part of the – root of the bramble that is in Bra in dark bramble but we'll get to that in right. later and inside right. i threw my scout in and i saw the whole galaxy basically kind of in there and then as i was kind of scratching my head thinking what is going on in this game all of a sudden a blue light engulfed me and i completed my first loop Oh, okay, I got you. So, yeah, so I basically I did the 22-minute loop 
on the first the first time and i i died because gotcha. i like ran out of time quote unquote Gotcha. What about you? So I have a funny, I, I have a funny story about like the, the seed, right? Mm-hmm. The seed on the, the seed, uh, on, the seed. on Timber Hearth. So I, I did the same thing. I went to the moon and then found a feldspar signal, went back to Timber Hearth and, you know, landed my ship. And so you go and talk to the guy that's in front of the seed and he tells you, Hey, you know, it, you might be able to fit your scout inside this. So the scout, if you don't know, is like a little kind of device you can fire. Mm-hmm. You can basically shoot a camera and the camera flies out and just takes pictures. You can take pictures and turn it around um, and like explore kind of a remote environment. It also basically. has a light on it. So it, it acts as yes. like a light source uh, whenever it's like too dark exactly. to see, which is very useful too. Exactly. So that's a big gameplay mechanic. But at the start of the game, like I knew about this, I knew about the scout launcher, but I, I didn't remember like how I didn't remember that. I I didn't know, I guess is a better way to put it, that it was tied to the suit. So since I was on Timber Hearth, I didn't need to be wearing my spacesuit, right? Mm-hmm. And so I was like struggling, trying to figure out how to equip the uh, the scout launcher. But I remembered you could fire it from the ship. So I literally <laughs> spent like 15 minutes trying to like maneuver my ship no. around to get it <laughs> in the right place where I could fire the scout from the ship into the seed and never was able to do oh it. Oh my God. And then like I went back to the ship went somewhere else, put my suit on and like immediately realized it. Uh, um, but that was such a funny moment. Like so I, I felt like such an idiot, <laughs> like, because I don't know, like I, I, cause I just, I really hadn't done that much exploring yeah. yet. So I didn't fully know like to associate these things. Um, but I thought that the was game hilarious. makes you feel dumb in, in so, so many ways, but like the biggest way is <laughs> nothing made me feel worse than ending a loop dying or or supernova hitting me and then reliving my 22 minute of gameplay that i didn't accomplish anything i <laughs> i just walked around read a couple of things and then i finished the loop and sometimes like <laughs> i could see myself flying the ship and struggling and that was my like you know oh, reliving God. my my loop was so funny every time that's so funny so but yeah so this like death loop mechanic mm-hmm. right where when you die you essentially go back to the start of the game and you you have no idea why no. at the beginning of the game right like this is just something that's happening but that's kind of the core mechanic of the game is this death loop and you kind of start to realize that you know like we said there's this big mystery in the universe basically and the big mystery right now is just why am I reincarnating pretty yeah. much? Like, why am I going back in time when I die? And as far um, as you know, no one else is experiencing this except you. Yes. Or you're, exactly. obviously everyone else, everyone is experiencing it, but you're the only one who knows that you're experiencing yes. it. Yes. Yeah. So that's kind of like the crux of the early game is just trying to gain knowledge about why, like you, you don't really make any, there's no leveling up, there's no XP, there's no anything. The only progression you make in this game is your knowledge, mm-hmm. right? And the game kind of keeps track of stuff you explore, which is really nice. Um, but that's really it, right, is, is your brain. Yeah. What, what, what pieces are you fitting together? What, how are you kind of connecting these different threads of information scattered around? Um, which is super unique. I think it's a really a really cool way to set up a game. Like, I think it's super interesting. Um, I think, but from, yeah, go ahead. I I just, I was going to say, I think overall the game is, it's incredibly unique and incredibly smart. And it's probably one of the most unique experiences I've ever had in gaming. A hundred percent. And that's just full credit to Mobius Digital is the, the, the developer. That's it's, it really is when you were saying, is this game going to be life changing? Uh, you know, I, I don't know, life changing is huge, <laughs> but it's definitely impactful. It's definitely very impactful. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Totally agree. So from there, you know, we found this dark bramble seed mm-hmm. and you don't, you don't really have a lot of context for even what that is at this point yeah. in the game. Um, but where did you, like, what was your next step? Where did you go kind of after that? So I perished and then basically, <laughs> right. 
<laughs> and I talked to all the villagers. No one knew what, what I was talking about. And I was like, all right, whatever. I'm going to go explore again. And I didn't really follow that. I went to Brittle Hollow was my first kind of planet that I went to check out. Yeah. I just thought it was really cool. I really liked that the moon is basically a volcanic uh i don't know it's just a volcanic moon i guess and it just shoots meteors at brittle hollow and yeah. that planet i feel like maybe the first planet that you explore is the one that like you you like love the most because that's when i started reading all about the nomai and obviously they had the hanging mm -hmm. city in right in brittle hollow and basically this the again the nomai are the clan that inhabited this solar system before the harthians and they settled one of the clans settled in brittle hollow and that's when you start understanding what they were trying to achieve you start piecing things together as you explore all of these planets and brittle hollow is interesting because it has a black hole as its core and it i thought it was <laughs> crazy and that was one of my first like crazy moments in the game where i fell into the black hole accidentally and then I got transported at the edge of the solar system. And I don't know if this happened to you, but coincidentally to me, the interloper, which is the meteor that is oh, yeah. kind of like, um, it's not a meteor. Well, I guess it is a meteor, right? It's, it's a comet. A comet so it's a, a comet, comet that's you. on like, you know, you have the solar system, there's the sun at the center, and then all the planets are kind of in orbital loops around the sun, right? Yeah. But then there's another body called the interloper, like you said, and it's on this big like elliptical loop mm -hmm. where it only, it goes like very far out of the solar system, like, like a comet does, and then like comes back in every so often. Yeah. So that, that was by the white hole when you went through it. That, and so I didn't even have my ship with me and I just managed to land on it with my suit Oh, wow. And I explored it and I didn't understand anything that was going on. No, I started absolutely reading not. <laughs> so much stuff in there and I, and I was like, okay, this, this is so much. Uh, but that was, yeah, that was kind of like my first few expeditions were Riddle Hollow, trying to understand everything there, Interloper. And then I started, okay, I need to go. I, I don't know. I feel like the game kind of, we probably all had a very, not, it doesn't have to be the same experience, but a similar experience where you go to a planet, you find clues, and then your ship remembers the clues, thankfully, because I wouldn't be able to remember all of them myself. And then yeah. you just start picking, okay, well, I'm going to follow this clue. That's I have to go to the Ash Twins and see what's going on over there. And then you go and maybe you won't find anything or you won't find what you're trying to find. You'll find something different. And that's because one of the biggest tools in outer wilds that is in your signal scope or the scout is time itself different things right. happen at different times i guess in the loop and that can be really frustrating at the beginning of the game to understand why i'm seeing certain things at certain times and you know why whenever you spend like 15 minutes in ash twin you find a certain specific thing because all the sand is getting pulled away but like if you go there immediately you don't find anything you're like ah this planet sucks i'm gonna leave and go somewhere else so th those are the type of things that you have to be really patient with this game if the game mm -hmm. has such a big thing to tell you but if you are not patient with it you're gonna miss so much and and that definitely was something that i felt very impatient a lot of times yeah i totally agree so that when when do when did you first like kind of realize the time nature of it like for me it was you know i went to brittle hollow same as you brittle hollow so so i found it so hard to traverse because of like the hollowness Ooh, of it yeah but yeah, once yeah. so like i was just bumbling around on brittle hollow pretty much and then I just like stumbled upon Ryback or Reback, yeah. however yeah, yeah, yeah. you say his name, the, the explorer on that planet. Um, pure vibes on the banjo, <laughs> just yeah. plucking away. Probably the best character in the game, I think. Uh, in oh, really? Game. That's cute. Um, but just pure vibes. Um, but after I was, so I did the same as you. I went into the, um, I fell in the black hole because, you know, of course I did. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, just bad at the game at this point right <laughs> yeah. um 
but it lined up in such a way that as soon as I went through the black hole, the sun went supernova. So it reached that uh, timing point in the game. Yeah. And so I, like, that was the first time the sun had gone supernova for me at the yeah. end of the time loop. So, but it was kind of blocked from view for whatever reason at that moment. So I didn't even fully understand what was happening. Like, I didn't think it was a supernova. Yeah. I basically just thought, that I died because I went through the black hole, oh, like something, yeah. you know, I went, so I was like avoiding that. Um, but it was just so weird. Like it just, the timing of it lined up in such a way that it like gave me such a weird idea about what was going on. Yeah. I didn't know it was the sun for a while either. I, it, I like you yeah. thought it was just, okay, I, like it's over. My 22 minutes are gone. I didn't even know it was 22 minutes. Like I, I wasn't timing it. I was just, yeah. you know, time is done. Time yeah, to start yeah. over. I'll figure out one day. Um, until I messed up with my ship, I was trying to get to one of the further planets, maybe Dark Bramble or Giant Steep, and I missed it completely, and I was going way too quick. And so I just absolutely was like kilometers and kilometers away <laughs> from, <laughs> from the solar system. I had to exit my ship because there was no way that my ship was going to stop itself. I think I damaged it or something. And then I started yeah. thrusting back and it just it literally took me, you know, minutes and minutes and minutes to thrust back with my suit. And finally, I saw the sun explode. And I was like, oh, <laughs> that's what's going on, you know. Um, so that so that's actually like you almost got a secret ending of the game pretty much in that moment. So it's wait, possible. Really? Yeah, it, it's possible to fly far enough away from the sun that you don't die in the supernova and if you don't die in the supernova you don't go back in time oh, and like wow. the time loop doesn't start over so it's just like the game is just over you're just stranded what? in space pretty much and that's you get like a like an end screen saying like i hope you know you're far enough away and escape the blast of the supernova, but now you're alone in the reaches of space. Uh, I hope there's something to eat out here or oh something my like God. that. That is so cool. So that's like, it's like a secret, secret ending pretty much. Oh, I wish I would have gotten um, it. That's awesome. You almost did. It sounds yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> but uh, that's so funny. But yeah, so I think like there is not like a set path, but there's definitely the game nudges you in certain directions, right? Yeah. So like you, I went to Brittle Hollow kind of first thing. That was the first like major planet I explored. Mm -hmm. And there, you know, you learn about the black hole eventually. Um, maybe the second or third time I went through the black hole, I found the white hole station. Yep. So when you go through the black hole, like you said, it brings you to a white hole at like the edge of the solar system. Mm -hmm. And there's like a floating remnants of a space station there. And if you go in it, you can figure out through like some different mechanics that there's a warp system in this game. There's teleportation. So basically, you have to be standing on a warp pad. Mm -hmm. Each warp pad is connected with like a partner, basically. There's a partner, some partner warp pad somewhere else in the solar system. And if you're standing on the warp pad at the specific moment in time, you get warped to that other exactly. warp pad. So that, I feel like you're kind of supposed to fall through the black hole and figure out that mechanic kind of in that way. Um, but once you figure that out, a lot starts to open up, right? Because yeah. you, like, I, I think kind of similarly to you, the next place I explored to Brittle Hollow um was the hourglass twin mm -hmm. so the ember twin and the ash twin and like you kind of alluded to as the uh the time loop goes on as the 22 minutes goes on the sand on the ash twin starts to move like an hourglass to the ember twin yeah and so that results in two things right so the ember twin starts to fill up with sand mm -hmm. and the ash twin starts to kind of shrink down so kind of exposing some things and that's like a huge, you maybe don't realize it at the time, but that's like a huge gameplay mechanic. Oh, it's yeah. where a lot of the like major puzzles in the game, I feel, come from. Like some of the more involved puzzles, I guess. Did you, what, what was your first like 
experience with those kind of time puzzles on the Ash Twin and the Ember Twin? I think, you know, everything to me at least happened like at random. You know, I, I don't know. I wasn't okay. looking for things specifically. But the first thing was that I warped, that I figured out like how to warp from the uh, Ash Twin. You can warp to all other celestial beings. So right. I warped to Giant's Deep, I think, for the first time. And that was kind of like the first thing, like, oh, okay, if I do certain things in this planet, I can warp to everything else, kind of like what you're saying. Um, yeah. But no, I, I don't know. I think for me, it was very random. What about you? Like, did you, were you looking for something specific? I feel like I played this game pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you're, you're, it's kind of, I feel like the early game is supposed to be like that because yeah. you have no, you have no idea like anything in the early game. So like the first couple hours for me, was literally just bumbling around, like mm -hmm. trying to find random stuff. And like, then I started to pick up on some of the story threads and like follow leads. Like, I think the first thing for me that started that was being on the Ember twin mm -hmm. and I found the distress pod. So yeah, 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 yeah. You've, there's these distress pods, the Nomai, you there's... learn from like, wall writings that they had like a crash landing basically their big ship called the vessel had a crash landing but you don't know where the ship is mm -hmm. but there's these escape pods kind of scattered around that you can find using the signal scope to pick up on their signals um so on the ember twin i found the escape pod and the escape pod leads you kind of to like a cave system and if you follow the cave system it leads you to like an underground city yeah. that the Nomai uh, kind of established on the Ember Twin. And that is like the location of the one of the bigger puzzles in the game, I think, that underground city. Yeah. And it has a lot to do with that kind of timing component, definitely. Yeah. Um, so, but kind of to talk a little bit about that puzzle. So on the Adel Rock, right, on the moon, mm -hmm. you find a kind of device that's supposed to be locating something called the eye of the universe. Yes. And you don't even really know what that is, right? It's very ambiguous. It's just the eye of the universe. Like, what could that be? But the locator doesn't work. And so the Nomai say, this doesn't work. Let's go build a more advanced version of the eye locator on the south pole of Brittle Hollow. So, you know, maybe you make your way over to Brittle Hollow and you know, you make your way into the high end, into the advanced locator through one way or the other. Um, and that one doesn't work mm -hmm. either. So you still can't locate the eye of the universe, but they say, you know, we have to go to the high energy lab to really try to find out like exactly what's happening here. Um, and so, and it tells you that that high energy lab is on the Ember twin um, but the path on Ember Twin is closed off. And there's like a path in the underground city in the Ember Twin that tells you it leads you there, but it's impossible to traverse because there's like all these cactuses in the way. Mm -hmm. um, so did you, at, at that point, when you're going through that, did you connect the dots of like how you're supposed to solve the puzzle or was it more of like a brute force thing? yeah it was a brute force thing for me i mean i didn't know <laughs> yeah. i was using my there's also um when you try to go to that path with the cactuses it's full not just of that but something very important in the game and in the story it's the yes the, uh ghost matter um ghost matter right and i kept dying because i always forgot to check the ghost matter in it uh, everywhere, right. basically, you know, and th there's a little like uh, warning that is like, there's ghost matter around, you know, like, be careful. Uh, yeah, but no, that's basically I brute forced it, brute forced my way. And then you find one of the most important things that you alluded to, which is the black and white hole, or like the quantum, mm -hmm. uh, the I don't know, the one of the quantum rules that the Nomai had on. Yeah. The observing well, it's not, it's not the observing and ex extracting, identifying yet. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think so. No, but it's anyways. I'm not sure. But how did you find it? Yeah, so I sort of realized, because when I first tried to get to the high energy lab, it was blocked off by the sand, the rising sand oh, okay. on the Ember Twin. And so I knew there was like some kind of connection there. So 
on my next run through, I basically just beelined it to the Ember Twin and managed to make it in the door before the sand filled it up. And then from there, like that basically solves the puzzle because there's only one way to go. And like the sand is filling up, um, but you just have to make your way. It's like almost a claustrophobic moment because you're in this cave system. The floor is like rising. Yeah. And if you go too slow, you, you get, get crushed. like <laughs> crushed against the ceiling, yeah, right? Yeah. I got so crushed a couple of times. You have to like, <laughs> yeah, you make your way through. You have to, there's the ghost matter, like you said, which you can only detect or you can only see where it is with the scout launcher and if you go into it it's just insta death right mm -hmm. you just die yeah. immediately if you go in the ghost matter um there's a couple of things that so you, you have to make your way through too. yeah but what i don't know what you're alluding to i said there's a couple of things that you can only see with the scout also it, yeah i don't know what you're alluding matter. to the moon the quantum moon oh yeah no you can see it without the scout but you can you can like if you you have to look at it with the scout it stays where it is and then you yes can correct Sorry, yeah yeah that's yeah. What I meant. That's what I meant. yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> um but so you make your way to the the high energy lab right mm -hmm. through this kind of puzzle system um and eventually when you get there you figure out that the nomai realize that when you go through these black hole warps the things coming out of the other side are actually getting there earlier than when they went in, right? Yeah. So, but it's by like a very small fraction of time, pretty That's much. That's what right? um, um, Solana is that her name? Their name? Yeah. So that's um, how they figured out too that whenever they warp for the first time, and they looked at their you know clocks. I don't know what clocks they the Noma used. They were at the edge of I think Brittle Hollow before they even like went in to the black hole. So that's kind of exactly. like also all of this information again it's because you're reading every single thing that the nomai mm -hmm. ever experience because of their writings that they would leave behind to help each other figure it out in like the centuries that they lived in uh, the solar system and also just so happens exactly. that you lived there you were there thousands of years later and you can read it and you figure it out as well thankfully Without yeah, so that, that, you that, that's an out. important note, right? Is that that writing, the writings they leave behind is like pretty much the biggest, like that. that's what drives the plot. There's no other exposition, really. I mean, there's a few people to talk to, but that exposition really just comes through like reading these logs, basically. Yeah. Um, so that's like a really big component of the game. Um, but so in the high energy lab, the Nomai realize they can send things back in time and they theorize that if they use enough power, they can send things even further back in time. And so you don't really realize like, like that's crazy that, 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 that that's happening, right? Yeah. Obviously, but you don't really, you don't really know what that's connected to mm -hmm. at that point. Um, and so well, they start playing like, with the idea. Yes. You don't know what what uh you're it's happening at that point but then you start reading that one of them god i i wish i could remember all their names i feel like i never there's really, some yeah. it's impossible yeah <laughs> one of yeah. them said that you need so much power that you might be able to use a supernova or something yeah harness the power of the sun to pull enough power so that this can happen so you can go back yeah. in time and that's when I started connecting the dots for myself. Did you mm -hmm. ever, mm. were you, did you ever try to land on the solar station? I never tried to land on it. I definitely like saw it, mm -hmm. but I had crashed into the sun because of the sun's like strong uh, cool. gravity pull yeah. so many times that I just like didn't even try. Okay. Cause I was like, there's no way <laughs> I try to go close to the sun. I'm going to die. Yeah. I was going to try Same thing. I tried a bunch uh, and I just, I could never do it. Yeah. yeah, but so that but so there's this station orbiting like very closely to the sun, yeah. right? And in like you were alluding to, the Nomai are realizing they could potentially use the power of the sun exploding mm -hmm. to send things like way further back in time. And so I feel like that kind of prompts you to try to get to the sun station. So for me, I by that point i i kind of knew how i was supposed to do it so i knew i had to go to the ash twin 
wait for the sand to go down far enough where I could get in the sun tower yep. and then teleport there, mm-hmm. right? Um, so that teleports you to this like fiery, you know, you're right outside the yeah. sun, basically. <laughs> it's super violent and crazy. And, you know, of course, the first time I went there, I f- like you, the solar, solar station is in like two parts. And the first thing you have to do is fly from <laughs> one part to the other, yeah. just in your jetpack. And of course, the first time I went, I totally overshot Same, it, dude. just went directly <laughs> into the sun, yeah. had to start over. Um, but eventually, when you get there, you realize or you learn that the Nomai were creating the sun system or the, the sun station as a weapon, basically, to try to explode the sun yeah. to power this uh this you know device that sends things back it, it was it was more like a it was a weapon but it was more like a yeah it just it was trying to like take the life out of the sun or like uh expedite its like half-life so that yes. it would explode quicker uh it wasn't right. like it wasn't right. like a missile that would just explode the sun but then they realized yeah. that it didn't work yeah so it doesn't work mm-hmm. so at this point in the game you kind of know what you know about the warping you know about you know going back in time which gives you like a little bit of a clue as to what be might what might be going on with the time warp um but you don't really know like what the overarching goal is yeah. i think um and i feel like you don't really realize that you don't you, you don't kind of connect that final piece of the puzzle until you go and explore giants deep for sure right? Um, and did you I think explore my, Giant Steep early? No, or was I, it like a little? I feel like for you? definitely it was. I spent most of my time Brittle Hollow and Ashtwin, those two being the Amber Twin. Sorry, those two being the cities where the Nomai uh, yes. actually settled. Just there was just so much content in those two. Totally, that I basically yeah. spent most of my time there until. Yeah, I had to go and explore. And actually, I think one of the ac- warping accidents that I had was going to Giant Steep. And that was the first time that I ever saw it with all its cyclones and water. And then we Gosh, meet, yeah. I think, my favorite guy in uh, the game, Gabro. Yes, Gabro. <laughs> the <laughs> ultimate, ultimate chill, bro. The ultimate chill, bro. Just- if Brian Buck is chill, good vibes, this is not, he's not good vibes, it's just... He doesn't care of anything that's going on. No. <laughs> so the only other person that is experiencing this time loop with you is Gabro. Gabro actually was the guy who brought the statue over to Timber Hearth uh, to begin with. And he connected with a different statue in uh, Giant Steep. And he also experiences a time loop, but he doesn't know what's going on because he loses his ship, so they can't do anything. Every time they wake up, they are without a ship, and they're just kind of hanging out. Yeah, yeah. So Gabro is just, like, stuck on this planet, basically, yeah. with nothing really to be able to do. I feel like most of the explorers um, are stuck. Rhinebeck is also stuck. Like, he's... Uh, well, Rhinebeck is stuck because he's just, scared. like, a scared yeah. cat, right? <laughs> like, he just doesn't want to go. Yeah, he doesn't want to go. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so... Gabro tells you like where to find the mask he connected with Mm -hmm. on an island, right? So you go there and find a mask workshop where the Nomai are creating these masks. And that gives you some uh, setup as to what like the actual masks and the statues are. So pretty much the masks are like memory devices. They harvest information and then the goal of the Nomai is to send that information back in time. Exactly. Um, and so, you know, you start to put it together that since you linked with the statue at the very beginning of the game, that's why when the loop happens, you kind of retain your memories when nobody else does because the statue is like feeding it to you and it's retaining the information. Yeah. But you still don't know why the loop is happening in the first place like how like physically how is the loop happening and i feel like that's kind of the next big thing that you try to explore in my opinion so what it how did you go about and do that so i throughout the game there's these like allusions to the ash twin project Mm -hmm. and it's like very 
secretive in a way. Like it's referred to in whispers almost like, <laughs> oh, the Ash Twin Project. Yeah. Um, and you don't really know like well, what because it is. It's the, sorry, just again, it's hard to explain and go deep into every single thing about this game. But like these were beings. These were people that lived in a city, yeah. in different cities, and they had like lives and children and stuff. And these group, small group of scientists that were doing the Ashman project literally wanted to create a supernova knowing that they would, they have, there was a chance that what they were doing wasn't going to work and they were going to eradicate yeah. their, their lives and their clan, you know? So that's why there's a lot of the exploration. It's kind of almost fearful. Like it almost makes you nervous that like, that's what happened to them and obviously you see the corpses of the nomai everywhere and you're like okay well <laughs> at, at that point you still don't know what happened to them and you're like okay something went wrong and they all yeah. perished you know but that's why everything is so secretive because it's just not right you know i mean imagine and you you get those like competing perspectives yeah. right through the game like through the writings and the logs and stuff you get the perspective of people saying like, yes, we should explode the sun. This is like important for scientific inquiry. We need to do this, blah, blah, blah. And then there's other people that are like, no, that's like a terrible thing to do. Like you said, there's a chance we could ruin our entire civilization. Yeah. Like we should not do this. It's not worth it. Um, and so there, there, but there's a, along with that, there's all these like vague allusions to the Ash Twin project. Right. Um, and so that was like the next kind of major place I knew I had to visit or try to figure out. And the game tells you that there's no direct way to access. You know that it's like at the core of the Ash Twin, but there's no direct way. It tells you it's sealed off. There's no way in. Yeah. Um, and what you have to put together is that the warp system, the black hole warping system has, it's tethered to like the individual planets, right? Like each planet has a warp, mm -hmm. but because that the hourglass twins are so close together, they act as one gravitational unit, basically one celestial body. And so with that, the warp point is kind of in the middle of them. Mm -hmm. And so if you, go to the uh, hourglass twin towers on the ash twin at the right time. And it's tough because when to, to warp from the ash twin to the ash twin, you have to be looking at the ember twin. Yeah. But when you're looking at the ember twin, there's a giant column of sand over you. Yeah. <laughs> that's like pulling everything to the ember twin. Yeah, yeah. So you have to figure out, you have to like hide in a little nook in the tower basically, yeah. and then run out right at the end and that warps you to the core of the Ash Twin, I, which is where the Ash Twin project. I messed it up located. so many times. Sorry that I kept. I messed it up so many times. The timing of that, yeah, that I would same, get pulled same. all the way to either the Ember Twin or like I would like have to like start over. And it takes a few minutes for the uh, Ember Twin to, or which one's rotating? Yeah. Maybe the Ash Twin is rotating. I guess if you're on the Ash Twin, you perceive the Ember Twin rotating. That all of that yeah, perception yeah. stuff is also kind of, you know, awesome in the game. They they the physics mechanics is, is so good. Um, but so anyways, good. yeah. So you go into the core of um, of this celestial body, as Ben saying, and then you find a lot of stuff inside. Yeah. Uh, the so I, one thing we for one thing we forgot to mention is that also on Giants Deep you learn that there's like an orbital probe cannon yeah. in the mm -hmm. in the orbit of Giants Deep, and so the probe is built since none of the other detector devices for the Eye of the Universe work. The Nomai basically decide we're going to brute force this mm -hmm. and just fire a probe in a random direction and hope that it comes across the eye of the universe, basically. And so when you wake up at the start of every time loop, you see the giant's deep above you, and there's an explosion in the atmosphere, yeah. and you don't know what it is, and you can see something fly off. <laughs> and so at the beginning of the game, you know, you have no idea what that is, but you realize that that's the probe firing at the start of every time loop yep. to try to find and brute force its way to finding the eye of the universe, right? But so their goal of that is to 
So the goal of the Nomai, right? At this point, you've you know you've visited the Ashtrim project and realized they're trying to send information back in time to themselves. We know they're trying to supernova the sun to use the power to send things back in time, and we know they're trying to fire a probe to find the eye of the universe. So you put it all together and realize that basically their setup is fire a probe and then in 22 minutes explode the sun Mm -hmm. and send the probe back in time. And so in the present, and you know, it's hard to explain because of the, you know, abstract nature of this, but basically what that means is you'll get the information of the probe, you know, in the present before the sun has exploded. And so their goal basically is to find the eye of the universe. And on the one they they're planning on repeating this until they you know, find hundreds, yeah. thousands, millions of times, potentially until they find the eye. And their goal is to keep doing it until it finds the eye. And at that point, when they know, since it's in the past, they'll realize, okay, turn it off. Turn, don't, don't, explode don't explode the, the sun. sun. Yeah. We have the coordinates. Yeah, we'll do it. But, as we know, we've been to the sun station. It doesn't work, yeah. right? The sun station does not explode the sun. So they're basically, you know, they're screwed. Their, their plan didn't work. They don't really know what else to do. And at that point in time, um, there's like a little blurb of text, right? Where it says like, this didn't work. You know, it's a shame. We might have to try and figure something else out to find the eye of the universe. But hey, this comet Mm -hmm. just entered the solar system. Let's go explore it. And you know, (laughs) maybe let's go explore it. So what what tell me tell me a little bit more about you exploring the interloper, the comet that enters the solar system. So you you explore the interloper and then it's a really interesting and another fun little time puzzle that you have to do because the interloper is frozen. But as Ben was saying earlier, it has an elliptical orbit around the sun. And that ellipsis makes it so that it's really close to the sun for a little bit of time. And that melts the ice on the interloper. And then you can go and explore deep within it. Also, when you explore the interloper for the first time, you find a, a basically a, a pod, right? You find that one of the, it's not an escape pod, but it's just a, some travel I, ship. I think it's just a ship. It's just a uh, ship. I know my ship. And yeah that's there's a recording so there's two different types of um of messages that you transcribe either written messages or sound messages there's no audio in the game uh not obviously there's audio in the game there's no um voice acting in the game so it's just kind of it's just text again but i think you have to interpret it as that you're listening to it um yeah and you realize that yeah that's they wanted to explore it and so you go in and you find a green, basically huge shard that is full of uh, the ghost matter. Right. Yeah, and so basically, it the the Nomai realize they reach the core of the interloper, and they can tell it's under a lot of pressure, mm-hmm. and whatever's inside it might explode soon. And so they start basically panicking trying to run and alert people alert the rest of the people in the the nomai in the solar system that this thing's about to explode but at that point it's too late right and the interloper the core of it explodes instantly filling the solar system with the ghost matter and killing all of the nomai right so so the nomai had you know all of these grand designs their big plan did not work, and then they, you know, perish yeah. as a species, pretty much. You can you see know, the... At, at random, pretty much. Yeah, because, yeah. yeah so. it's something that they, yeah. Out of all the, I don't know, I feel like the Nomai were just so smart and, like, we're figuring all of this out, but, like, you know, that wasn't ever in their calculation. And as Ben was saying, you can see the panic in the Nomai everywhere in the solar system because it's so weird and that was one of the first things that i noticed that their bodies are just scattered everywhere and i'm like what is going on like all of a a lot of them you can tell that they were running or that they were hiding or something and one of them that is 
one that you see a lot when you're trying to finish the game is in the Ash Twin, where you're trying to go to the core of the celestial being so that you can find, you can get the ult the ultimate core that you have to bring to get to the vessel yeah. or bring to the vessel. Um, there is a Nomai that is trying to get inside of the core to maybe hide or try not to get hit by the, the ghost matter. And you see him like kind of yeah. laying, running towards the core. So I don't know, it's super sad, um, but as Ben was saying, everything that they work towards, the firing of the the coordinates to try to get the coordinates of the eye, the harnessing of the power of the supernova, all of that worked. The only thing that didn't work was making the supernova happen. So you fast exactly. forward millions of years, I think, into yeah. the future. And yeah, presumably. finally, the sun actually finishes its lifetime. And then it explodes, yeah. creating a natural supernova that starts the Ash Twin project. And yes. you wake up and that's when you realize, oh my God, <laughs> I am basically a, a being right now that is supposed to, that is inside the project. Like I am the Nomai now that is, yeah. I'm not a Nomai, but that is supposed to finish and do what they were trying to achieve, which is to reach the eye of the universe. Which I still, exactly. it's still very vague what that means. And I feel like everyone has their own interpretation of maybe what the eye of the universe is. But once you yeah. had all of that information, Ben, you, you put it all together for us. Yeah, so you, you know, you have the game plan at this point, right? And I think the only thing we didn't talk about so far is the dark bramble, yeah, which is right. basically mm -hmm. this like, you know, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's like a bramble of vines and thorns at the edge of the solar system. You can go there and, you know, eventually by using the scout launcher on the seed that's on Timber Hearth, you can find Feldspar who's trapped in the dark bramble. And he gives you some information, but for the most part is kind of just big chilling <laughs> in the dark bramble. Right? Seems like every hearth in is big chilling. Yeah, but when you're there, you also, by using your signal scope, you realize there's another escape pod distress signal yeah. in the dark bramble. And if you follow it, you find another one of these escape pods from the ship. And then there's a path from there that leads you to the Nomai vessel, right? This big vessel that they use to warp around in the solar system and the universe. Um, but it's not turned on. And so to turn it on, you know at this point, you know you need what's called the advanced warp core, this kind of advanced black hole warping power device from the center of the Ash Twin project. Yeah. The problem is when you take out the advanced warp core from the center of the Ash Twin project, you're essentially turning off the Ash Twin project. Yes. So you are yes. ending the loop if you do that. Yeah. So it's there's a lot of stake a lot at stake for for you to make sure that that happens correctly yeah and so the game plan is to grab that power core and bring it over to the vessel and then from there you have no idea what you're going to find your thought is that yeah. okay you probably go to the eye of the universe but you don't really know what that is you also yeah. don't even know how to get there because you need some coordinates <laughs> And yeah, the, the coordinates, coordinates so are we've... from the, again, what Ben was saying, the uh, the cannon from the giant steep that is trying right. to send the coordinates back to the Nomai. Yes, exactly. So you have the coordinates and it's like a bit, like you said, it's kind of tense. Did, did you die within that kind of Dude, time? Dude, I did. did I, I, like three or four yeah. times. I was having a lot of, t uh, I, I don't know. I had a lot of trouble getting past the... Um, Everything from the Ashwin was kind of easy. From there, mm -hmm. you're racing towards, uh, you don't really have to race, but you kind of are racing towards Dark Bramble. And I struggled yeah. so much reaching the, the, the vessel in Dark Bramble. Mm -hmm. You have to go through three levels of basically navigating in the Dark Bramble to reach uh, the vessel. And in the first one and the third one, there are these crazy celestial beings called uh anglerfish i guess they're not celestial beings i don't even know what they are they're just huge monsters that yeah. will eat you if you make any sound 
But what would happen to me is, especially when I was going on the first level, I wasn't able to like navigate towards the center where the distress signal was without using like my thrusters. And so I would try to thrust and then I would immediately get eaten and then I would have to start over. And that just happened a few times, maybe four or five times yeah. and until I finally got it. Yeah. And so, yeah, so finally you get it, you reach the vessel, you have the coordinates, you have the advanced warp core, you turn on the thing and warp to the eye of the universe, yeah. right? And you still don't really know what even that is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. The Nomai didn't even know what that was supposed to be. Yeah. They just know it's there and it's probably important in some way. So you get there and it's like this kind of terrifying environment. Yeah. There's like lightning storms there's you know super trees dark. and rocks and stuff super dark everything's moving around because it's all quantum tied to the quantum mechanics um and eventually you reach it and you jump into the eye of the universe and it sends you through this like wormhole crazy, looking thing <laughs> yeah wormhole and it kicks off this like journey outside of time basically so it brings you back to timber hearth back to the museum Seemingly. and oh, yeah, there's yeah. all sorts of things in the museum where it seems like it's further in the future and people know that you found the eye of the universe, but there's nobody around. And then from there, it brings you to this glade of trees where there's little, you know, flecks of light everywhere and it's very pretty. And one by one, those flecks of light start to kind of explode yeah. in mini explosions and you realize that those are galaxies mm -hmm. that are galaxies that are that are dying pretty much and exploding all around you um and from there in the middle of this forest you come upon eventually a campfire and then at the campfire appears esker and esker like esker always does is just rocking back and forth <laughs> in his rocking chair and he's basically just like oh you need to you know, it's not time to play yet, yeah. pretty much. You need to go find everyone else. And so from there, you can use your signal scope and find all of the signals of the instruments from the different explorers that you found throughout the game. They each have like a little puzzle associated with them. Um, but eventually, you get them all back to the campfire. And why don't you walk me through kind of that that ending sequence of the game? It's, it's, it's gorgeous, honestly. Um everyone is at the campfire and you're kind of all hanging out together and uh you when you talk to each of them they tell you hey i'm ready to play are you ready now and it's kind of like yeah. i have chills thinking about it because same, you're same. thinking you know what are they talking about you still kind of don't really know what's going on but obviously you're above time and space at this point you're somewhere yeah. that no one has ever been in and then they all start slowly playing their instruments and they all come together to make the song that they've all been playing this whole time that you didn't know that when you put it together, it's the main theme of Outer Wilds. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, this huge orb of white appears uh, and it starts expanding, expanding and expanding. And then you jump into it. And then you basically create, I think, in my, uh, well, the game ends then, but there's a big bang and a big flash and it says you know outer wilds yeah. thanks for playing but i think that you have just created the big bang and you restarted the whole yeah universe is yeah. how i interpret yeah i to totally agree so that that was my interpretation as well the the ending you know the symphony of music was such <sighs> so a beautiful, beautiful moment it was so so cool um and then yeah basically what you don't really realize is that you the time you're living in is close to like the death of this universe the universe is dying and nobody really seems to know that except for one character who who kind of alludes to it if you talk to him um but nobody knows the universe is dying and that's what you know the exploding galaxies and the ending sequence symbolize is that you know the universe is experiencing the slow death and so with you know jumping into this mysterious floating orb at the very end. Yeah, I think you're right. I think the universe ends pretty yeah. much. And all of it seems like the what I got from it is that you're the music, right? The music you're creating, which is kind of symbolic of the journey 
and your experiences and everything, the music that you collectively create with the other explorers is the formation of the next universe. Oh. And then based on, you know, some things that might may or may not have happened in your run through, um, there's a post credit scene, right? And so in the post credit, it shows you that 14 billion years in the future, there's a new universe with new planets and new campfires and new explorers sitting around the campfire. Um, and that's, you know, that's the end. That's that. That's, that's, that's outer wilds. So, ah, so good. I think, um, super impactful ending for sure. Yeah. Um, definitely impactful. It definitely, you know, it, it, it gives you the chills. Like, yeah. like you said, I think a little bit, um, but yeah, anything to add kind of besides that before we, we put a bow on it. No, I think, uh, yeah, I think for me, this game is such a unique and great experience. And for a lot of people, it's probably their, one of their most treasured games ever. I think yeah. I, I, I had a, a tough time playing it. Um, I think mechanically it was fine. Like I love flying the ship around and that was like my most fun part of it. I think I struggled with it because I couldn't put the time in into the game as much as I wanted to because of life, because maybe I didn't have the drive to to do it. I struggled with understanding what was going on with the game and that frustrating me. And instead of trying to figure it out and flying everywhere uh, because of my, my limited time, I wanted something a little more like linear, like, okay, take me here, take me there. Let me figure it yeah. out. And then, like, let me <laughs> this get... is not that. <laughs> no, this game is, I think I had like, hours and hours and hours but I, I where i felt that i wasn't making any progress and that was kind of frustrating to me so sure. i think if this if i had played this at any other point in my life or if maybe i was a little younger or older i don't know i would have probably enjoyed it more but i think that the i had to start looking up guides and stuff i needed to finish the game so instead of kind of letting it naturally dictate how i was playing it i had to manually pull something up to tell me, okay, where do I need to go next? Like, what do I need to find next? How do I need to, you know, fill or solve these time puzzles because I just don't have the mental capacity to do it in the moment. I think, yeah. <clears throat> unfortunately, Outer Worlds is one of those games that you can probably only play once because you already know everything that's going on once you figure it out. Um, yeah. So it's hard to replay it, but yeah, I don't know. I think, this is a very special game. And I think for me, it was special enough, but not incredibly special. I don't know. What about you? I think that's totally fair. I, I, I totally agree with that assessment. I think like you, like there were points in the game where, you know, I had to look up a couple guides or hints or something like that. So I didn't like, it wasn't a pure experience for me, I guess. Like it's like, it's supposed to be. Um, but yeah, I feel like the, the ending of the game kind of was powerful enough. And I think yeah. the overall message and experience of the game was good enough to where it like, you know, elevates it to a special tier of game, right? Like a game that if you're at all interested in these types of games or experience, you should you should play mm. it at, at some point. Like it's, it's a special game for sure. And one that I'm really glad exists and one that, you know, I'm really glad we, we played for sure. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. No, the, the beauty of this game is, is uh, second to none. Like I, I totally, yeah. yeah, this is such a good game. And like you said, I'm so glad that it exists and that people can experience it. And it kind of makes you existential in some way, but I think that they navigate totally. that very well everyone in the game like ben says they're chill they're kind of happy-go-lucky they're just kind of they're they're just existing and at the end of the day that's all we can do just exist and do the things that we want to do and not the, and not do the things that we don't want to do i don't know uh yeah and it's like you know you you can only do so much but at the same time your your music right your music is what you contribute to the universe and yeah. everybody has their own song to play and their own their own part in this orchestra 
that that we call life um <laughs> wow. and with that we're gonna take a little break and we're gonna come back in part two with some questions benny that was beautiful you're making my heart cry Welcome to part two of Video Game Book Club, where we ask each other questions about the game. And we also answer listener questions that you can send to us on YouTube, short, or YouTube TikTok, and Instagram at Buenale Games. Buenale, B-U-E-N-A-L-E dot games. Find us, yes. Video Game Book Club. Uh, ben. So we, got some, we got some good listener questions this time yes. i'm gonna start oh, us off you were saying last time we didn't <laughs> no we had some good ones last time too but we got some bangers okay so go ahead you know like jp said definitely get your questions in for next month's episode um the first question and it's a hard one no no from at max j gold our boy oh, our special guy. guy would you describe outer wilds as a narrative game or a puzzle game and to that end, do you feel it nailed the difficulty curve or are there sections that are too difficult or maybe too trivial? What do you think? <clears throat> that's, a, that's a really good one. Um, oh man, I think the amount of reading that you have to do definitely outweighs the amount of puzzling that you have to do. So I would probably describe this game as a narrative game first and foremost, but it's definitely like an adventure slash it's like an exploration narrative game with puzzle elements in it. Probably um, the difficulty curve is pretty steep at the beginning. I think there, there's a clear uh, distinction from like early game to, okay, I'm, I know what's going on and it's yeah. really obtuse. Uh, I think maybe for some people it probably that plays other narrative, maybe puzzle games, figure it out but if you're like me <clears throat> excuse me who struggled at the beginning you probably will struggle even more to get over that curve um but if you if you felt that the beginning was great if you could put like five hours in one sitting in the game then you probably got over that <clears throat> excuse me that curve a lot easier go ahead I'm yeah i totally I, <laughs> I i totally agree i think in terms of whether it's a narrative game or a puzzle game, it's definitely both, but in like a non-traditional way. Like the sure. puzzles, there's only really a handful of like gameplay puzzles in the game. Like there's only really a couple of them. I think the main puzzle of the game happens up here, right? Mm. It happens with like in your head with the information you're gathering through the narrative elements and just piecing it all together and like kind of unraveling this overarching narrative and story. Um, so I think it's more of a narrative than a puzzle game, but the narrative kind of is the puzzle. If that yeah, makes sense. Yeah. That, that makes total sense. That makes total sense. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Max yeah. J gold. I have a, uh, the second question from Instagram at Roberto and V 95. And he asks, from God of War 2018 to Minecraft, how would you scale Outer Wilds narrative and exploration? Have you played yeah, so God of War? I haven't played God of War, I, but I know it's mostly like linear, right? Yeah, it like is. it's a pretty linear experience. Very linear. So experience. from on, on the spectrum of that to Minecraft, um, it's definitely closer to Minecraft but a little more structured, right? Because Minecraft is just like, there's no narrative. I mean, I, there kind of is, like there's sort of a story in Minecraft, but the narrative in Minecraft is whatever you make it, right? Like you can do whatever yeah. you want. You you kind of make your own missions and you know stuff to do. Um, whereas in this game, the exploration is very much on like a similar scale, mm -hmm. but it's more structured in terms of like what you're, kind of supposed to be doing yeah um, is what i would say to that but then the narrative part of it so that's the exploration but the narrative part of it is all the way on the other side of the spectrum right is that what you're trying to say because of in minecraft, terms of like minecraft closer to god no of War. narrative but then yeah. this game is full of lore and story and things that yes you figure it out yeah exactly i, I so think it even has the... more than god of war 2018 like 20 god of war 2018 is a story this is like a whole con a whole like galaxy worth of like story you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. Um, okay, let's do so. The last listener question from our number one fan. It is at Joe M. Ken. How long do you need to spend on puzzles? And we touched on this a little bit already. How long do you personally need to spend on puzzles before you look up a guide or look up an answer or something like that? Where is where is that line to you of like figuring it out versus this is a waste of time, basically? That's a great question. I basically, at my work, I just problem solve every day. So I love solving problems and puzzles. Um, I think that there's a distinction for me. It's not about the time. It's about how close I can get to the goal. Right. So if I attempt a puzzle and I feel like I'm not making any progress towards the goal or the progress isn't like super linear, uh, then I will get increasingly frustrated. So for example, if a puzzle is abstract enough that I don't even know how what the end goal of it should be or what it should look like, then that will frustrate me greatly. And I probably won't spend as much time to solve this puzzle. Whereas if a puzzle is more concrete and more of like a brain breaker, brain teaser or whatever, and there is a clear defined solution, you just need to get to it. Oh my God, I could spend days trying to solve it. I, I love that. Like, um, logical puzzles and stuff my grandfather used to always ask me like you know there's there's four people two people are wearing different hat colors and they're in a straight line you know how do you know which one has whichever color hat that logical stuff i love to do but yeah. stuff from outer wilds it was it could be a lot more obtuse and that that definitely i struggle with that a little bit for sure yeah for me uh, this is something we experienced with uh animal well as well right because there's to me, like you kind of described two different types of puzzles. And I think there was both in that game and in this game too. Mm -hmm. Like there's in Animal Well, there's the kind of first layer puzzles of stuff where you know you'll be able to figure it out. It's just a matter of like spending the time, trying to work it out in your head. Like you'll get there eventually. Um, but then there's like, you know, all the other layers of Animal Well where like, you basically stand no chance of figuring them out yeah. on your own. And you have to either use resources or have some sort of community trying to figure it out together. Um, I think Outer Wilds is mostly in the first category where I think you can definitely spend the time and take the time yourself. And I think that's probably how most people do it. Um, take the time yourself to, to figure it all out. Um, but, you know, for us, we were on like a time crunch. I was, I was moving this month. You were, you know, busy with work, I'm sure. Um, so we didn't have necessarily hours to sit around trying to like figure these puzzles out. So there were definitely areas in the game where, you know, I, I looked up a guide or one thing I appreciated about the community for this game is that the community is so set on you experiencing these things for yourself that if you look up like, how to solve this puzzle. Nobody, like there's guides you can find, but no one in the community will tell you how to do it. They yeah. just give you like hints. They'll say like, well, when's another time you've seen this symbol? Or like, how, when did you see this in the time cycle or something like that? Nobody is willing to like, because that having that, like experiencing the aha moments and putting things together is so central to this game. Um, and I thought that was so cool as like a community thing. Like people are so invested in you having this experience basically. Yeah, I um, totally agree. Yeah. So I think we, um, I've got some lightning round questions for okay. you. Do you want to yeah. get into that? Let's do it. I have okay. a couple questions so I'm gonna, from my side too. Okay. I'm going to hit you with the lightning round. So, what ready yeah okay what was the hardest puzzle do you think in the game uh i honestly i struggled getting into the ash twin core okay, i didn't know yeah. how i didn't know how <laughs> you mentioned this already but who is your favorite band member uh gabro for sure gabro just chill bro chilling yeah. out playing <laughs> his little flute favorite planet oh um 
Ember Twin. I would I would live in those caves. Oh yeah. Okay. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What was your funniest death in the game? Oh my god. I mean, probably asphyxiating. Just landing in a planet and get being ready. Oh baby, I'm about to go explore and figure out this puzzle, and then opening the hatch and dying immediately because I forgot to put my suit. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. That one and sure. last but not least, what was your favorite moment in the game? Ooh. I mean, it's hard to beat the ending. It, it right. really is so hard to beat, uh, like, all the band members playing in the orchestra. Uh, but probably that's everyone's favorite moment. Uh, I think I'm going to say, honestly, that story that I said earlier, watching the supernova explode from space and that being, like, the moment that I understood that the sun had just exploded, I feel like that brought me a lot of, like, an aha moment, like, oh, my God. I am kind of am piecing things together from this game, just from my own perception, not even from the writings on the wall. I'm going to say that's Love my that. favorite moment. Yeah. Love it. Um, okay. Then you ready for mine? Yes. It's, this is, this is very similar, but if you were part of one of the Naomi and uh, Naomi, no, my clans, and you had to live in one of the celestial beings, which one would it be? And you can't, it can't be Tim. Oh my God. They're all terrible. Yeah, they are. <laughs> They're, They're so awful. bad, dude. They're so bad. <laughs> Uh, I mean, there's no good option, right? I feel like the Giants Deep, just because, like, Gabbro is chilling <laughs> yeah. there. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It, it's like, you know, there's roaming tornadoes and cyclones and hurricanes and stuff, but there's at least some, I don't know, peace on the planet. Yeah. You can, like, have a little bit of solitude. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's my answer. That's good. <laughs> Uh, does the ending remind you of anything? And I'm specifically talking about the, the forest with all the galaxies. Anything? Totally. So I, mm. so I just finished reading, uh, the three body problem, the mm -hmm. book series, three body problem. Um, and in that one of the main like ideas in that series of sci-fi books is that the universe is this dark forest right mm -hmm. and within the dark forest there's these little pockets of life within different galaxies but everybody's quiet because if you speak up basically if you send out signals and make your make your voice in the universe heard that's going to alert people in the surrounding areas that might not be very friendly mm -hmm. um so the like set the setting at the end of the game in the dark forest with like the little galaxies uh kind of scattered throughout reminded me a lot of that for sure was there something you specifically were thinking of yeah yeah totally that's awesome uh i it's this is from the narnia series um the first book it's not the first book written but the first book in the cr chronology of it uh the magician's nephew that's the first time that they go to Narnia or they understand that Narnia exists, but it's Narnia is not the only like world. Uh, basically the protagonists fall into this forest, just like this, that has a puddle that, uh, not one puddle. It has millions of puddles everywhere in this forest. And if they jump into a puddle, they go into a different world and then they can get uh. out and they fall into another puddle, different world. And then they, Find Narnia, you know, but yeah, that it reminded right. me of that. Also, I jumped through a galaxy just because I wanted to see what would happen, and I destroyed a galaxy myself. If you jump through a galaxy <sighs> in the game, <laughs> so Dang, I, bro, I think of all the people you killed, all the people that I killed, all the people <laughs> that I, killed. I thought about it. it, made me sad. Um, then I have, dun, 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 sorry, okay. A lot of the Timber Hearth explorers, they're all kind of stuck in one way or another in a planet. So this is kind of right. different. But if you were the first Outer Wilds explorer, the first one, and you were out there and you wanted to explore the celestial life, which planet are you most attracted to? But just because you want to understand physically how it works, not because you want to live there. Mm. I feel like the most the most like 
point of intrigue is the dark bramble yeah for sure like because it's out there we know there's a dark bramble seed on timber hearth which might spell disaster like it might destroy timber hearth eventually which is alluded to um but it's such like an enigmatic thing that if i were like you know i'm gonna go explore i'm gonna find some answers to what's going on i feel like that's probably where i'm heading which would 100 percent result in my death but like <laughs> yeah that's that's where i'm going oh yeah that's awesome <laughs> Uh, and that's it. That's that's all the questions for me. So Ben, let's put a bow on Outer Wilds, our video game of the month for August 2024. Yes. Give me a yes. book report for it. All right. So I'm going to say this game, like we said, extremely unique in terms of the, the structure of the narrative. Um, extremely interesting to play and explore i think there were some some weaknesses like for me but you know it's not a weakness of the game but like the hardware was a weakness for me it was just hard to play on the switch but i eventually got used to it um but i think overall for me the overarching narrative the narrative structure and the ending makes it like a solid a minus Agreed. I was going to put it in A. Yeah, but we can say A minus. Um, you can put it in A, bro. No, no, no. no you no. put it this in is, A. We're, we're, we're like Stand this. on the table. Tell me why I'm wrong. <laughs> no, I think, I think you know, earlier I, I just, yeah, same things as you. This game is just so unique and so special. I almost, I almost like ache that I didn't experience it as like uniquely mm. and amazingly as like other people have. Uh, so right. A minus. A minus, baby. Let's put it A minus. Yeah, A minus. A, a. I think I can justify an A for sure. Like it's so, it's such a unique game. Yeah, I, I could go A as well, definitely. Um, Ben, what else have you been playing? Dude, what else have we been playing? <laughs> We've been on the deadlock grind, bro. Dude, we're grinding I gotta give deadlock. a shout out to random Steam user uh, Cyber underscore Ray. Don't know who that is. Kind of a weird name. Um, but he hooked me up with the deadlock invite. And I hooked you up. Wait, I didn't know this. How? What? How did that happen? How did this random I just, user? I, no, I, I know who he is. Oh. I'm just messing with them. <laughs> <laughs> so, but we deadlock. So if you don't know, deadlock is the new Valve game. It's basically a combination of a MOBA and a third-person shooter that I think probably skews closer to a MOBA than a shooter. Sure. Um, but it's like a hero shooter, super fun. It's like a super early, you know, access, very early development, but insanely fun. Like I'm, so I'm having an awesome time with it. Been having so much fun. Benny and I have been laning together and we've been losing, <laughs> but we've been having a great yes. time playing together. Yes. Uh, I played for with sure. a, a friend yesterday for a couple of matches and we won both and it was the first oh. pvp match that i won i think so Let's you know i beat go. the bots all right i beat the bots but yeah uh, pvp yeah. was has been <laughs> tough um but i have also been playing the oh. video game of the month for september uh, 2024 dude yes give it to me give it to me we're gonna play <laughs> nine souls nine, nine. Souls. i've never i've never, never heard, heard of it this. so no. obviously there's a huge game that was just released uh black myth wukong who maybe yes. everyone and their yes. mom is playing it has like two hundred and fifty thousand reviews already on steam in like a week uh, i'm pocketing that one you know for the future i feel like it has a lot of bugs still is what i've heard that like it's kind of hard to play also super fair expansive so i feel like maybe yeah. that can be something that we can play in the future but Nine Souls is a Sekiro-inspired Metroidvania uh, that is absolutely sick, and the art is sick, and apparently it has a really gruesome and intense story, uh, and I'm super excited to, to play it. So I played maybe like the introduction oh, to it and the first boss just to kind of try it. But I know that you're a Sekiro bo- boy, and I, I know that you're going to really, really enjoy it. It's all about timing parrying uh, every time you parry you get like a one of your skills 
kind of like you know how in hollow knight you have yeah. your, your spirit your skill that you can change out it works mm -hmm. kind of similar in this one but you can only charge it if you parry so oh. you parry and you get what charge and then you can like do your skill so you're like constantly parrying doing the skill parrying hitting a couple times doing the skill so it has a okay. beautiful kind of like combat to it and the story it is very cruel and gruesome and it kind of intense but basically you're this guy and you just are trying to defeat the other nine souls that's that's all i'm gonna give uh so okay <laughs> let's go well yeah if you listen to our first episode on another crab's treasure you know that i am a sekiro truther i i think it's the best souls game um so sign me up i'm down I'm i was excited. thinking about let's you go. i was thinking about you it plays amazing on steam deck that's what i've been playing a little bit on there um obviously you don't have that <laughs> but for those out there who do try it out on that because uh, it definitely plays great and yeah make sure you play it play it with us and then come back ask your questions and you know join the book club get, join we got to get more people in the book club you know you got to tell tell your priest about the book club yeah um you can tell your librarian tell your librarian might be interested uh let's see bus driver the bus driver might want to play um I don't know who else we can do like your, Definitely your tell professor, your, mom, your, your college professor, your college professor, tell your best friend, uh, yeah. tell your best friend's best friend. If it's not you, you know, you have to have a serious conversation, but have it over book right. club, over video game book club. Right. Uh, right, right, right. And yeah, please follow us on uh, YouTube, Instagram. Uh, we're trying to be as uh, engaging as we can. It's kind of hard sometimes, but we are at when games, uh, for all three of them. So give us a little shout out. And with that, we're going to see you on the next episode of Video Game Book Club. Nine souls. There's no you on the souls, okay? It's nine and then S-O-L-S on uh, Let's go. September 2024. Let's go. Nine souls. Bye.